Well, let's get started while the screen is warming up here. So today, the first thing is it was spectacularly unwise of me to try to do linear algebra in the last class. I should not have done that. It did nothing but add to the confusion. And if there was anyone in here who had any idea what I was talking about, I probably could have done it in my office just as easily. So I apologize for that decision. I don't know what, what got into me there. Ignore that part of the video. The class will have nothing to do with that. And I won't do that any more of that kind of algebra again. We'll do regular algebra, but no more linear algebra. Now, part of the reason for saying that is I detect and expect and realize that at this point you don't have these procedures down completely. So the idea today is to first write down the procedure one more time in full, go to the computer, do an example, and encourage you to ask questions whenever you don't get a step that I'm doing so that you get this and that you can do your homeworks. Once you can do it on eViews, it'll become much more clear because you'll, you'll have the, the procedure in your head and you'll, you'll, it'll inductively, you'll realize why it is that you're doing it the way you're doing it. It'll start to make some sense, I think. But you first have to get that procedure internalized before you can start making the connections. So let's go over the procedure for correcting for heteroscedasticity and then we'll, we'll do the demonstration of how to correct it. So, so far what we learned is when you have heteroscedasticity, there's problems with OLS. It's not a bias problem. It's an efficiency problem. So if we have heteroscedasticity, OLS is not the most efficient estimator. So we need a way to test for it. So we came up with several tests, I believe five of them. We did a Goldfeld quant test. We split the sample into three pieces and throw out the middle and look for differences in the variances in the two groups. We looked at some LM tests where you use models, model A, model B, model C as the basis of your test. And then we looked at a very simple multiplicative model, sigma squared i is alpha or sigma squared times xi squared or something like that, a very simple model as a basis. Um, and we also looked at White's test. And so there, there's basically three tests. There's the Goldfeld quant test, there's all the LM tests with the three models, maybe four if you include that other simple one. Then there's the White's test. And I'm not going to illustrate Goldfeld quant, but I'll illustrate the other two tests today, the White's test, and how to do one of those three, and the other, the other ones ought to be relatively simple at that point. So that's the goal. So let's recall what the steps are for doing this test. And let me use my notes so I don't write them down different than I did before. I think I did this last time, but I only did it for part A. So let me just generalize it, make sure you have in your notes all the, all the steps. But you have most of this already. So these are the steps for correcting for heteroscedasticity. And the, the main issue, the main thing we want to do is divide by the variance. We want to divide by the standard deviation at every point in time. So we need an estimate of the standard deviation. So most of these procedures, this is all about getting an estimate of the standard deviation, dividing by it, and doing a new regression. So the first step was to regress y on, again, we did this last time, a constant, and x2 to xk. I wrote x1 last time and corrected myself, so I, we did this. This gives you the estimated parameters. Those estimated parameters allow you to calculate the estimated error. You have t is yt minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x2i minus beta k hat xki. So we use the estimated coefficients to get an estimate of the residual. It's y, my, there are models y equals beta 1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta to the k xk plus u. Once we have, we don't know the betas, so we don't know the true u. What's the true u? Um, so what we do is we get estimates of the betas. And once we have the estimates of the betas, we can subtract from the y 
to get an estimate of the error. So this is what we're after. We just subtract that minus that. Notice also that later on, we're going to need to do the procedure. We're going to need the predicted values of some variables. How do you get the predicted value? Well, that this is the predicted part, and this is the error. So if I wanted just the predicted values, I can take y minus resid. Because resid in the program is u hat. So if I just want that whole sum, I don't have to calculate that. I can get it easily out of the computer. y minus u hat gives me the predicted values, the estimated values here. It gives me the forecast for each x. So we'll make use of that later as well. But anyway, so you get ui hat this way. And again, we keep saying, this is just the variable resid in the program. And so that's not a hard thing to find. Then there's 3a, 3b, and 3c. A is to regress u hat i squared. So you take that u hat and you square it on a constant z1 up to zp. And then this would be the basis. If you're going to do a test, we're correcting for it now, but this is where you do your nr squared test, if you're actually going to do the test. So this is the step where you do the test to see if you need to go on. We've already done the test. We know we have heteroscedasticity. We won't repeat them. But this is where you do the test for whichever model you have. Um, so you run the regression. But, well, yeah, you do that. Um, then what you would do for 3a so you regress u hat i squared equals alpha naught plus alpha 1 z1 plus alpha p z <coughs> plus an error so you, you use this estimate of u hat t squared to run that regression that gives you the alpha hats. Now this is the step that people have trouble with in the procedure. This seems to be the one place <clears> that people get hung up. We have to use the predicted value of this. It's kind of a hat hat. I'm going to give it a new name. So what we need is sigma hat squared i equals alpha, oops, um, I did something I shouldn't have done. This should be 1, and this should both be 2s. Just the way we've indexed it in the past. Technically, that was fine. We could just change our index, but we don't want to do that. <laughs> so this is going to be alpha 1 hat plus alpha 2 hat z2 plus <coughs> alpha p hat zp. And you get this as in the program u hat i squared minus resid. You run this regression, you get the residual, then just like we just said, the predicted value is this thing minus the residual. That's going to give you the predicted value from this regression. And it's the predicted values that we want. We want the, we, we want the variances to follow this model. We've, we've imposed a model on the variances, so we need the variance the model gives us. So these are the variances predicted by the model that we've imposed on the data. These are not. A lot of people want to use these as their estimate of the sigma. They want to use this as an estimate of that. This is not the predicted values. This is not the model values. We want the ones that satisfy the model that we've imposed on the data. Just say it once again. You can say the same thing. So again, this is a step that people seem to have a little trouble with. But use. We'll, we'll all, all note that as we go through as well, where, where that happens. Now from here, you use this to get sigma hat i. It's a square root. You just take the square root. Then you'll divide by sigma hat i, that is, You'll form yi 
over sigma hat i equals beta 1. So we divide the whole model by that sigma hat i plus beta 2 times x2 over sigma hat i plus plus beta k xk over sigma hat i ki 2i. I should have put the i's in. These are i's down here. These are sigma hat i. I'm being a little sloppy with my writing here. These are i's. So it's x2i over sigma hat i, xki over sigma hat i, plus, we've been using u, I believe, ui over sigma hat i. Dividing u by an estimate of its standard deviation. If we estimate this model, it will be, so this is what we've called, I don't want to do this again. Um, I want to save those steps for now. So let me just go from here to here. That's what we call our star model. So what we have is yi star is beta 1 x1 star. x1 star is this. This is x2 star. This is xk star. And this over here is y star. Sort of outer. So we just run this regression. Call that u star. And that's blue. We fixed the problem. As we showed last time, this u star has homoscedastic errors because we've divided through by something that fixes it. So that's the procedure. It's not really that, that, that hard, I guess. OK, how would it change if it was 3D? We would regress. That's the model where it's just sigma i equals. In our estimate of sigma i is the absolute value of the error. So here we take the absolute value of ui on that step. Remember, because the model here is instead of sigma i squared is, is alpha 1 plus <coughs> alpha 2. Instead of this model, our underlying model is really sigma squared equals, and this is our estimate of that. Then we get an estimate of that here. So um, this second model is just sigma. And our estimate of sigma is this. So that's only so change that. Now you would run this regression. I realize you have to write more than I do, so I need to go slow here. So you run the original regression. Save the UIs. Take the absolute value of UI and regress it on the Zs. Now, instead of getting sigma hat squared, we're just getting sigma. Because I have a UI here. This is a test. This is sigma i's estimate. So this is what we're using as a proxy for sigma i. This is our proxy variable. And then we get sigma i hat from this regression. And we, everything else is the same. Once we have sigma hat, nothing changes. So that's all that's different with model b. It's simply all that's going to change is how you get this thing. Once you get that, you do it the same. It doesn't depend on the procedure. It's all about getting the estimate of sigma i hat. So depending on the model you have, it changes how you get sigma i hat. But once you have it, you divide by it, and it's blue. And if we knew it, we wouldn't have to do any of these things. We just divide by the true value, but we don't know it. That's the problem.
Uh, okay, so we get sigma i hat by getting u u hat i squared minus resid, or is that? Oh, in this point? case. Okay. Sorry, I okay. didn't change that. Yes, yes. In this case, you have to get that. That's going to give you the predicted values. We don't. Um, yeah, yeah. This is an S. This is what you use to get that. This is equal to sigma i hat in this case. In this case. In the last case, it was sigma i squared hat. When, uh, when we run the 3a mm -hmm. in the program, mm -hmm. we still take the absolute value of that, though. Right? You, you squared it. <laughs> So you're not going to have to, because you took the UIs that came out of the resids, then the, you have to form resid squared, and when you form resid squared, it already makes them all positive, because it squares them. In, in 3A... He had us, um, in the lab yesterday, he had us still do the absolute value. <laughs> well, well just a, a, we'll call that an abundance of caution. And... If you want to teach one procedure for all three, that's fine. But technically, for three A, you don't have to take the absolute value because it's already positive. Now, one thing that can go wrong in these procedures is that, and I, I should have put this step in. I haven't yet. I was going to warn you at the end. It's possible that these things are negative. There's nothing that restricts this prediction to make this positive. Most of the time they'll be positive, but it's possible that they're negative. So this is the step where you often want to take the absolute value. You may have done it here, yeah. just to be sure that you don't have a negative variance. I think that is positive. Yeah. So if they did it there, that's exactly what you want to do. And I left that out because I didn't want to add a little complication. I was going to throw that in later. And with 3C, one of the advantages of the third model that I haven't talked about yet is you'll never get a negative variance. So that's only a problem with models 1 and 2, models A and B. With model C, this will never give you a negative variance. So it's a good idea to just routinely take the absolute value here, even though you don't always need to at this step. Because these can be negative. So one problem. These can be negative, so use the absolute value. And you probably can't read that way back there. It's this problem, this could be less than zero, so use the absolute value. So. No, I think we did it. <laughs> you may have done it over here where you don't need to. You may not have done it here where you need to. <laughs> That's what I'm doing in the class, too. And I'll talk to you. <laughs> well, let's do model C, just while we're here. What's C? What do we want here? We want the log of u hat i squared. Here. So this will be here the log of u i hat squared. What you get is the log of sigma hat squared pi. That's, that's what you're estimating when you take. In this case, you take the log of ui hat squared. You with me? Okay, I'm quiet. <laughs> Thank you.
And again, I'm using the erase, so I need to let you. Some of the people are writing this all down again, so I'll give you a little chance to catch up here. Now, here's what you need to do in this case. Use this to get sigma i, but it's a little bit different. Um, in this case, sigma i hat is e. It's the square root of that. How did I do it in my notes? Sigma i hat squared is e to the um, alpha 1 hat plus alpha 2 hat z2 plus alpha p hat zp. Because you have to get the sigma i hat to take e to this. What, what you do is you get this predicted value here. That gives you this thing. So to get this, you do this. Glad my arms are long enough. So you estimate this, and then you get the estimated value of this. You get this here. You just take this, this difference. That gives you this, this difference is this term right here. When you take this minus the error, you get this stuff. Go ahead. That's sig that sigma squared, not just sigma. Uh, in this case, it's not sigma i anymore. Yeah, yeah. What, what you're getting here, this is the log of sigma hat. It's actually the log of, it's that. The hat goes over the whole thing, technically. You're getting an estimate of that thing. All right, people, okay. I got you. We're not, we're not communicating. So stop. Back up. In this step, we, we run, so 3C, we run log of ui hat squared on a constant and the z's. So we get the log of u hat squared i is alpha 1 hat. Let me, let me do this one. So you run that. That's this regression right here. You run that regression. And now we need, so we need the predicted value of the log ui hat squared. We need the predicted value of this thing from this model. That's what this step is giving us. So now I'm doing this step. So I, I, I just run the original regression. I form this and run the secondary regression, the auxiliary regression, the alpha regressions are called. I run the auxiliary regression. And now I need the predicted value. So I take the log of ui hat squared minus resid. That gives me the predicted values. You with me? So you run the original model, get resid, square the resids, take the log of the resids, that's this. That's the log of the resids squared from your original regression. Regress that and all your z's. Then take the predicted value from that regression. That's an estimate of the log of sigma hat i squared. So what we've now estimated is this. That's what this estimates. We've got an estimate of this thing. 
We need to get back to sigma i. So if I take e to, to the log, so I've got an estimate of this. Call the estimate log sigma i squared half. So that's the estimate. Now I just take e to that estimate. e to the alpha 1 hat plus alpha 2 hat x2 plus alpha p hat, these are z's, z2, zp. That's an estimate of sigma squared. All I've done is take e to this thing to get sigma squared. Then I take the square root of that to get sigma i hat. The hard part on this one is untangling the regression to get back to sigma i hat. And once you have sigma i hat, divide through it, make your star variables, and you're done. Run your regression. But the hard part here is getting the sigma i hat. I've got the square, then just take the square root of this. I should maybe do this example too as we go through that. A good thing about this one is these will always be positive. You'll never have a negative variance to worry about in this case. <coughs> How can I make this clear? Um, I'm not sure. I think we just need to start doing them. I think that's when we'll see how to do it. So let's just start doing them. Let's do it. It's easier to understand on the computer. Yeah, let's, let's do it on the computer, because I think you'll see how it all fits together very simply then. <coughs> so I'm going to do exactly your homework problem. You have model 3A. I will do model 3B. And if when we're done with 3B, you're still looking at me with the faces I'm seeing right now, we'll go on to 3C. If it looks like you're going, okay, I get this now. I can do C, no sweat. Don't bother. Then we won't bother. I suspect we'll end up doing it but we shall see. And I should issue my typical warning that I'm about to go live here, and we'll see what happens. So uh, I could make a mistake. Let's hope not, but, uh, but will the projector come back on? That's the question of the day. I'm going to get rid of all this and rewrite it as we go through it. So that you have the steps along with the computer stuff. This all looks confusing and a bunch of scribbling and it's just too scary. So let's get this off the board. Okay, I've already opened eViews. Do that again. Oops, it's not on there. Is it? What's that? Just turn it back on, let's hope it works. It's not coming on. <laughs> this is what you really hope happens. All off, projector. 
I think if you turn it off, it doesn't let you turn it back on for a few seconds because it doesn't want to blow that expensive bulb out. So I think we're dealing with that. I hope. Turn it. I'm gonna take her down. It's all off. Start over. I hate this guy. So if you remember, we have a data set with salary and years, and our model is log salary equals beta one plus beta two years plus beta three, yay, it's coming on, years squared plus UI, years I, years I, salary I. And the data set went from one to 222. You know, I'm going to model that sigma squared I so here's the model of the variance. This is model D. That sigma i is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 years plus alpha 3 years squared. And so I'm going to run this, get ui hat, take the absolute value of u i hat, so my estimate of this will be the absolute value of u i hat. What the hell? Is it control? F8? Miracle. I hit connect to projector. Surprise, surprise, that worked. <laughs> okay, here we go. File, new work file. We have undated data from 1 to 222. I need to import the data set. Import from Excel. Should hit the right directory. <coughs> Data for problem three, open. And I think it's salary in years, right, is the order. Those look like years. Now let's get the log of salary. So log, oops, salary equals log salary. Let's get years squared. Right? Now let's run this first regression right here. <coughs> so I'm going to run this regression. So quick estimate. I'll show you one thing right here. See the options? See that very first option that says heteroscedastic consistent coefficient matrix with white checked? 
You check that box, it does White's correction, and you're done correcting for heteroscedasticity. So White's test is that easy. I want you to do it yourself the first time. After that, you can use that. Oh, for the correction, you can't do corrections yourself. There's a way to do the test, too. So we won't do this, but if I wanted to correct for White's, I would just do that, and we'd be done. And just run the regression. So White's correction's pretty easy, but we're not doing that. So what I want to do here is run log salary on a constant years and years squared. There it is. Now I need to make the absolute value of the residuals for this regression. If you're doing A at this point, you'd find resid squared. But I need the absolute value of the residuals for this. So I'm going to say generate abs u hat equals the absolute value of resid. <coughs> now these should all be positive even though the residuals themselves are sometimes negative. So I took the absolute value because variances can't be negative. Now I can run this regression. Okay? So now let's run the auxiliary regression. Everyone with me? Slow as I got started. Okay, so I need to run what? I need to say quick estimate. Oh, one other thing before I move on. Um, let me do it later. There's, there's, you can do White's test really fast here, but um, I'm not seeing it. Where'd it go? There it is, yeah, 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 thank you. Here it is. So if you hit this with the cross terms, so it's under view, residual test, whites test. So I, I don't use this program in my day-to-day -day work, so I don't know where all the options are. Um, that will do whites test for you. So you hit that button after you run your regression, you get whites test. If you have Heteroscedasticity, you rerun the regression by checking that box and you've corrected for it. So White's is pretty simple. If I, if I just tell it to do this, there it is. There's the, uh, there's the test right there. There's your nr squared, obs times r squared. It gives you the significance level in the whole works. So on your homework, you can check it pretty easy. Okay, let's go back to where we were, though. I hope I didn't screw things up by doing that. I don't think so. Okay, I need to run quick estimate this regression. So I need to run the absolute value of u hat on a constant years and years squared. So I'm running this regression right here. There it is. Now this resid has the errors from that regression in it that I just ran. This is the part I said that seems to confuse people, the part we got hung up with with a complicated one. Now I need the predicted value. So I need the predicted value of this. I need sigma i hat. I used a proxy for this. I used that as a proxy for this, but I, I'm trying, now I need sigma i hat. So let me just call it that. Let's call it sigma i hat. So let's say sigma hat is what? Abs u hat minus resid. 
right? So we took this regression. What I'm doing here is I'm taking this variable right here. We just ran the absolute value. We just ran the absolute value of u hat equals alpha naught plus alpha one years plus alpha two years squared. Now we want the predicted value. So abs u hat hat is abs u hat minus the resid for this equation. So that's what this statement's doing, is it's getting the predicted value from the model. Once I have sigma hat, I'm done. Form my star variables and run my regression. So now I just need to make y star, x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, and we're done. We now have the estimate of the sigma that we need to fix them. So everything up to this point is about getting, this is our estimate of sigma hat. All right, that's what I need. That's what I'm getting from this regression. Once I have that, then I can just do the correction. So I'll just say generate y star, let me call it um, log salary star equals log salary divided by sigma hat. <coughs> See that? Okay. I need the constant star. is 1 divided by sigma hat. Because I'm dividing through by this by sigma. So I just did that. I just got that variable. <coughs> now I'm getting, there's a 1 here. I'm getting 1 over sigma i for that variable. Now I'm going to do this one and this one. So year star. <laughs> Not up there. I don't know what I'm doing there. I have no idea what that does. <laughs> you can do it up there. Can I? Yeah. I'm afraid. I'm in front of a class. So year star is just years divided by sigma hat. And then finally year squared star. years squared divided by uh, sigma hat. Getting old. And now what's the very, very last step? Run the stars on the stars. So the last step is <coughs> quick estimate ln salary star constant star did I say constant or C? constant star uh, year star two S's are one ooh I missed an S year star and years did I put yeah, square star There is no constant, because we've divided by this. Don't put one in. Run that regression. And that's the corrected values, right there. So that's the, header of, that's the consistent estimates. Those are the blue estimates now. That help?
Yeah, I'm seeing heads nodding this way. <laughs> That's what I want to see. Let's do model three for fun. Will it be fun? Is that model two? This is model two. So this is abs you had. This is the one that says the model I ran here was model B, where sigma i is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2 plus alpha p z p plus an error. And this was, these were just the years, and these are the x's for me, exactly. So that's the model we ran. Your model is this, and the other model is that. Let me do this one, just to reinforce it. I'm just going to take it up to this where I get the, the sigma i hat and leave it to you to form the stars and run the regression. So I'm going to take it up to the point where we need the thing we need to form the star variables. How do you determine the coefficients? It's exactly the same way. The coefficients are the same old coefficients. So we, by dividing by sigma, we haven't changed the coefficients. So we get the, we're estimating the same slope parameters as we were before. It, it, it is a bit of a change because what you mean by unit change is now standardized. But it won't change. It doesn't change anything. You're still getting the betas because you standardized both sides. Never mind. Never mind. This is like if you took, if you change feet to inches on this side, and leave this side in feet, you'll change the betas. So if I multiply by 1 12th or divide by 12. But if I divide both sides by 12 to go from feet to inches, I'm not going to change the coefficient at all. So you're, you're basically just changing the units of measurement when you divide through is a way to think of it. Now it changes for every, it's different at every point in time, but it's essentially that intuition is why you get the same betas. I need to, I didn't save my resid variable, so I'd have to start over. Normally I said I like to write resid as u hat, just to have it there. But my resid is no longer the resid from the first regression. And I didn't save it, so I'm going to have to rerun the first regression. So let's rerun the first regression real fast. I've got it here somewhere, I just don't have the, I just don't have the, uh, there it is. I just don't have the residuals, and I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, resids. Uh... That's not what I want. <laughs> Let me just do it. Uh, quick estimate. What do I got here? What am I doing? Log salary. Constant years. Years squared. Okay, now I've got the right resid again. I hope. 0 0.046187. That should be the same as the absolute value of this one. 46187. We've got the right residuals. Great. Um, now I need to square them and then take the log of them. So u hat squared is resid squared. And then the log of u hat squared is the log of u hat squared. And I should say log in this package, right? Is it L-O-G? Yeah, it is. So now I have the log <coughs> of u hat squared. That's an estimate, that's a proxy for the log of sigma hat, sigma squared, which is what I really want. So this is my proxy for this, because I don't know that. Now I run this regression. <laughs> so I need to run um, the log of u hat squared on constant years and years <coughs> squared. So I'm running this regression right here.
Okay. There it is. Now I need the predicted values from this. I need, now what I need is an estimate of the log of sigma squared. So I need to get an estimate of this thing. I need the predicted value. So I want the log of sigma i squared hat. I need that predicted value. And that's going to be alpha 1 hat plus alpha 2 hat years plus alpha 3 hat years squared. So to get the predicted value, there's probably an easier way to do it, but this is the way I've been doing it because it makes you think about this. So I need those predicted values. So let's generate the log of sigma hat squared. equal to, what did I call this? The log u hat squared <coughs> minus resid. So I'm getting the predicted value from this regression. I'm taking I'm using that trick where I'm taking this minus the error to get this. I'm taking this variable here minus the residual to get this predicted value, like we said earlier. You have a mistake up there. Do I? Go A instead of A. Oh, thank you. You will have. You have. A. <coughs> Look better? We'll find out in one second here. Okay. <laughs> so now I have that, which is what I want. I just formed this variable. Now I need E. Now I need sigma hat. Squared is E to that. So sigma hat squared here. I hope I haven't used that already. Is is it EXP? Dang, I didn't plan on doing this when I didn't want. Uh, um, the log of sigma hat squared. <coughs> So now I'm going to get this here, which is really just sigma hat squared. Yay, EXP was right. And then how would I get sigma hat? Let's just take the square root. And then I would divide by sigma hat, run the stars. Now you're looking bored. That's a good sign for once. <laughs> or you've given up ever having any hope at all of understanding this, which is a bad sign. I'm hoping it's a good sign. See, what I'm, I'm assuming that everyone their computer's open is following along on eViews. <laughs> Okay, um, questions? I did forget to do something in one step. Any idea what that was? In the previous model, did I remember to take the absolute value of the sigmas to make sure they were all positive? 
I don't think I did. So minus three. Darn. That's basically what. All off. You got it? All right. It's not fun turning that damn thing back on. This keeps me from playing on the internet, so I'm going to turn this off. Otherwise, I'll be reading my email during class and stuff. Okay, um, that's it for heteroscedasticity then, pretty much. So before we go on to chapter 12, any questions about heteroscedasticity that you want answered? On the time series data, then, and autocorrelation. So, chapter 12 is about mostly about autocorrelation, which is another violation of our basic model of the assumptions that the Gauss Markov assumptions. So one of the assumptions that we made was that the variances were constant. The last chapter was all about what happens when they're not. The answer is, you divide through by an estimate of the variance and make them constant. <coughs> the hard part is getting an estimate of that variance, but once you have it in your hands, the solution's very easy. You just divide through, run the regression. And the hard part's getting the sigma i hat. So we're gonna move on then. We know what to do in that case. Now, what if another assumption that we have is that our errors are uncorrelated th through time? That's often a very, very bad assumption, especially in economics. Often when you're above trend, say that GDP is higher than normal, you can expect next quarter will be higher than trend as well. Your error tomorrow is related to your error today, related to your error the next day. Temperature is the same thing, it has persistence. So often, the errors will come in these wave patterns that kind of look like this. There'll be more distribution than that, of course, but they'll, be, they'll basically follow some sort of a wave where you know, you're above normal for a while and it's warm, you're below normal for a while, above normal, below, and so on. But the point is that this error and this error are not independent. If I know I'm 10 degrees warmer than normal, if I know that the economy is in a big recession, it's unlikely we're going to be at full employment tomorrow. It's unlikely that our 9.6% unemployment is going to turn into you know, 6% next month, even though initial claims for unemployment were 405,000 a day, which is very, very good news relative to the recent past. That's still not going to pull us out of this recession. Initial claims for unemployment came out today we like to see them below 400,000. When they hit 400,000, that's generally when labor markets are creating jobs rather than losing jobs. They've been up around four or 500,000 throughout the whole, even higher points, through the whole recession. Lately, in the last two or three weeks, they've started to come down, and today they're 405,000. First time they've been sort of in that range that we didn't suspect it was through data problems. So let's hope for your job market next spring once it goes to 400,000, the economy is creating more jobs than it's losing most of the time. And so and that would be good news if it went down. But anyway, um, it tends to come in these wave patterns. So what, what to do about that? Because the, the problem OLS is going to run into is it treats all of these errors as equally important. It says, ah, oh, this is brand new information that I didn't know about before. But it's not brand new information. A lot of it you already knew. If you were above trend, 
yesterday, you know you're going to be above trend today. So the fact that you observe a big error doesn't tell you anything important. Yet OLS thinks it does because it doesn't know the errors are correlated through time. So it treats every error as equally informative when in fact you're not adding a lot of new information with each new error because you already knew about a lot of it. One common model is that ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et. Suppose rho is 0.8. ut is 0.8 ut minus 1 plus et. That means 80% of today's error was in yesterday's. So 0.8 of yesterday's error carries through to today. There's persistence. And then there's only a little bit of innovation. So that randomness moves you around. You don't get exactly the same observation, and you get 0.8 of it. So there's a little bit of decay, but it's not new information. This is the new information. This is what we want to isolate. Once you've isolated the new information, OLS could do things right. But if we base our optimization on some of our UI squared minimization problem on this U, we're going to get the wrong answer because we think all those U's are independent when they're not. So OLS makes a bad assumption here and it leads to bad inferences. Now, I'm worried about running out of time before I get to a certain part of this and I've asked you a question on your homework. So I'm going to jump out of order in my notes here and tell you one thing and then we'll back up a little bit. The consequences of ignoring serial correlation. So suppose that you have Oh, wait a minute. This is next week's homework. I have Tuesday. <laughs> oh, well. That's just, I've already started. Um, suppose you have seri serial correlation, as we'll call it. The other name I'll use a lot is autocorrelation. The errors are correlated with themselves. These errors are correlated because of this relationship. You can actually write down what it is. <coughs> sigma squared e over 1 minus rho squared is the correlation. That's the covariance. Correlations rho. rho. Rho is the correlation. So, suppose you have zero correlation or autocorrelation as you might call it. And you do OLS. What are the properties? One, the coefficients remain unbiased and consistent but not if there is a lag dependent variable and I'll show you this in a little bit why that's true We're saying that one exception here, if I run Y, I'm going to start using T's now because we're in time series data instead of cross-sectional data. If I say that YT is beta 1 plus beta 2, YT minus 1 plus beta 3 XT plus UT, where T goes from 1 up to cap T, so we're just indexing with time rather than an I here. This is what I mean by a lag-dependent variable. If the yt appears on the right-hand side lagged, you no longer have unbiased, consistent estimators. They're still consistent. They won't be unbiased. Well, it depends. This is a problem. I'll explain this problem later. As long as that's not there, you're still unbiased and consistent. Two, OLS is inefficient in all cases, period. Even when it's unbiased, this is like heteroscedasticity, it's inefficient. So you're going to get the right center here. You'll hit the right, I didn't draw that very well. You'll hit the right average. So the coefficients are fine in terms of they're not biased or they're not inconsistent but they are inefficient. The variance in general will be too small. So a better estimator exists. 
There is a blue estimator, but OLS is not it. It's going to be a GLS estimator again, but we won't do it with linear algebra this time. And the third thing is that the standard errors are wrong. Standard errors of the betas, the things you use to get the T statistics and the F statistics are wrong. And they're often, in economics, biased downward. When you have what we call positive serial correlation. That's when today is positively related to today. So if ut, in that model, if ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et, when this rho is between 0 and 1, the, the standard errors are generally too small. There's also a condition on the x's I'm not going to talk about. But in general, when this problem exists, your standard errors will be too small. Now remember the problem on problem one, where you got a t-statistic of 129? So I had to run a regression on the very first homework. And I said, don't worry about the t-statistic. We'll talk about that later. And you should have gotten a t-statistic of some huge number, like 129. The reason why you got such a big T statistic is there's serial correlation in that model that you have not corrected for. That made your standard errors go way, way down. When you calculate T, which is the hypothesized beta minus the estimated beta over sigma hat, this is way too small when you have positive correlation. It makes your T way too big. So serial correlation makes you think you have significance when you don't. What's the standard option bias? Uh, oh, when positive serial correlation exists. So it's often biased downward when you have positive serial correlation. So the standard errors are too small when you have positive serial correlation. Now, it's possible to have negative correlation, then they're too big. But we don't see that very often in economics. Generally, when you're above trend, you stay above trend. You don't have this back and forth behavior. So most often, we have positive serial correlation. It blows up the T's, it blows up the F's, and it makes everything look significant when, in fact, they may not be. So you think you have significance that isn't there in reality. So your T's are too large, and you make bad, bad inferences. Okay, now our next goal then is to understand why it is that you have this problem between why you get bias in this case. So let's back up now. I guess I, I forgot your homework wasn't anyway. I was thinking it was the one that was due right away. The chapter starts by um, generalizing uh, the assumptions for estimates to be blue. We wrote these down the first day. When you get to time series, you have to generalize these a little bit. So let's do that. The first one they call C1 is the model is linear. That's, that's exactly like before. No need to talk about that. That's not new. C2 um, was the X's are non-stochastic. They're not random variables. The things on the right-hand side are picked by the experimenter. We talked about this the first day. They're not random variables. Well, I just wrote down an example. This is a random variable right here. This y is a random variable. We say it's predetermined because it's, the dice has already been rolled at this point in time, but it's a random variable. So the idea that in times, and this is a very, very common type of a model you see in, in time series all the time, in macroeconomics all the time. 
GDP today is related to GDP yesterday. Unemployment today is related to unemployment yesterday. Interest rates, yeah, you know, all that sort of stuff. So you see this all the time. The fact that we have this Y there tells us that we have random variables on the right hand side. So we can't go with this assumption anymore. In, the, in a part I skipped, and I'm going to skip, this doesn't cause big problems by itself. There's some assumptions and some things you have to do. There's some, cons there's some convergence conditions and some things. But for the most part, under fairly broad conditions, the fact that that's random alone is not a problem. As long as it's still uncorrelated with the U's, we'll be OK. So by itself, that's not generally what the problem is going to be. There's no perfect multicollinearity, no change there. That's still there. Error has zero mean. That's still there. No change in that one. That's not the problem here. C5 was homoscedastic errors. That was last chapter. So we're, we're, we're going to say that's fine. <coughs> we already covered that one. We're off to a new problem now. So that was last chapter, or today. Okay, this is the one that's a problem. Before we said that UT and US are independent when T is not equal to S. UI and UJ are independent. The, the errors are independent. That's all that says. The errors are independent. That was our assumption. That's not generally a problem with cross-sectional data. So if you're at a point in time and I'm measuring all the, the houses in the city or all the houses and prices in the nation, that's what we call cross-sectional data. There is what we call spatial autocorrelation that you can get in those data. But for the most part, this is not a problem in cross-sectional data like we've been using so far. It is a problem in time series, and it's, it's a very, very common problem. We've already explained why, that the error today is related to the error yesterday. And so a common model that we'll use a lot is ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et. And you need that rho is less than 1 to stop that thing from blowing up, to make it a stationary process, as we see. So that's going to be a big problem that we're going to have to deal with. The, the next assumption is also a big problem in time series data. And that is that the U's and the X's are uncorrelated. This, too, will be a big problem in time series data. Let me give you an example. I'll, I'll, I'll get into this in more detail, but just to show you an example. Suppose yt is beta 1 plus beta 2 yt minus 1 plus beta 3 xt plus ut. And ut is rho ut minus 1 plus et. So we have, we have correlated errors. Now, what we're saying is y and x cannot be correlated with, with the UTs, any of them. So this y and this x has to be uncorrelated with all the UTs. But look at this. Yt and ut are correlated, right? Because yt has ut. When ut goes up, yt goes up. So yt and ut are correlated, right? Therefore, yt minus 1, ooh. And, and ut minus 1 are correlated, right? So if I write this error as rho ut minus 1 plus et, which is the error term, that and that are correlated. Because yesterday, this was yt <coughs> minus 1, and this whole term here is ut minus. This is ut. 
Yesterday, this was y t minus one, and this was u t minus one. So that and that are correlated, clearly. Now that's a problem. That means all of our estimates are biased. Whenever you have correlation with the x's and the u's, your estimates are all biased, and that's a big, big problem. Let me do the next three real fast because um, they're not a problem. So the last one, I put 10 the first day because I added a couple, but the book only has eight assumptions. So I'll stick with their presentation for now. The errors are normally distributed. That's for testing. You don't really need that for the Gauss markup. I'm not sure why this one's there. But anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and assume that's fine. That's not the problem here. It's not the distribution of the errors that's causing these troubles. So what I need to show you next time is why it is that we have bias when we have these kinds of models. Are you feeling any more confident at all about the, the material? So this helped. I can't know what you don't know if I don't get feedback, so let me know what I need to do to help you.